I want to talk about the theology of sound as developed by Hugo Ball. The German author and poet Hugo Ball, died in 1927, is the best known for his sound poems. Fled from the horrors of the First World War's trenches, he founded the Dada movement in Zurich in 1916. There, Cabaret Voltaire was a popular podium for Gesamtkunst, but especially for sound poems, in which conventional language is destroyed in favor of an inner klang of the word within. On the 23rd of June 1970, Ball performed his most famous sound poem, Gatje Biri Bimba. According to his own account in Flucht aus der Zeit, at 1927, Ball went through an ecstatic experience. In this performance, Ball recognizes shadows of the uralte Dance der Priestlichen Lamentation. In a certain way, it meant the end of Dada for Ball, for he reconverted to the Catholic faith of his youth. Convinced of the authenticity of his own reconversion, and out of the will to prove his orthodoxy to his newly found fellow believers, Ball started a whole range of articles and essays about faith, society and religion, of which Zur Kritik der Deutschen Intelligenz, Byzantinisches Christentum and Die Folgende Reformation were the most prominent. On the 14th of September 1927, Ball died of cancer, only becoming 42 years old. Unfavored by critics and mostly neglected by scholars, Ball's theology of sound, which he implicitly postulates in Byzantinisches Christentum, contains traces of patristic theology, Kabbalistic mysticism, and the philosophy of language of the famous scholar Walter Benjamin. In this paper, I shall present Ball's theology of sound that is within the borders, the discrete borders of time, which has been granted to me. In 1886, Hugo Ball was born in a pious family in Piermasens, in the south of Germany. And after a troublesome youth, Ball managed to secure a studentship at the University of Munich. Just before finishing his master thesis on Nietzsche in 1910, Ball left his study and the academy in pursuit of a career as an artist. Having some experience in and some humble success with minor expressionistic poems and playwrights, Ball found himself as a dramaturg working for the Munich Kammerspiele. Eventually enthusiastic about the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, but declared unfit for military duties, Ball made a private trip to the war trenches in Belgium. Shocked and devastated by the inhumanities he witnessed there, he and his future wife, Emmy Hennings, fled to neutral Switzerland. In 1916, Ball and Hennings, together with later famous avant-gardists like Hans Arp, Richard Hustenbeck and Tristan Zara, founded Cabaret Voltaire, a literary and experimental café in Zurich, later to be thought as the birth of Dada movement. The Dada movement was an extreme form of the historical period known as avant-garde, somewhere between 1916 and 1920. Appalled and horrified by the atrocities of La Grande Guerre, artists like Ball, Richter and Arp wanted to destroy conventional society which had made the war possible. Inspired by Russian and French anarchistic thinkers like Bakunin, their primary target was the conventional language and the corrupting power structures which are upheld by it. The war had broken down the cosmic harmony which was the fundamental metaphysical pillar of the Romantic movement. Both the traditional metaphysics of Christianity and the positive ideology of the bourgeoisie could no longer be upheld. These nihilistic experiments of language and imagery reached paramount on the famous night of the 23rd June of 1917, when Ball performed his most renowned klanggedichte, Gatje Bibi Bimba, and we will listen to an impression of this.
it's uh, it's impossible not to smile I think in his own retro perspective Ball's performance is charged with religious meaning the chaos and absurdity of the world is specified by the invocation of the old ecclesiastical tradition according to Ball on the 2nd of December 1917 six months later Ball mentioned in Flucht his feelings when he heard the credo sung in church. Heute Abend sang ich das Credo unvermittelt, wie es mir immer wieder in diesen letzten Wochen durch den Sinn geht. Was ist das doch für ein wunderbarer Gesang? Alle Vokalen geben sich hier in der Kirche ein rauschendes, ewiges Stell dich ein. By evocating the credo from the Roman Catholic liturgy, Ball does not stress the intellectual dogmatic side of his newly found religion, but the associative side. Alle, vocabel, alle vocalen geben sich hier. This religious experience marked the end of Ball's involvement in Dada. The book Byzantinisches Christendom is not an easy book to describe or evaluate. It defies any attempt to summarize its contents. Heavy criticized by theologians like Dempf, Priswara, Stickelmeier and Gardini for its lack of scientific quality, something Ball did suggest by his broad use of footnotes and secondary literature, and the dualistic tendencies. The outline of Ball's Byzantine book follows the lives of three saints. John Climacus, the Pseudo Dionysius and Simon Stilitus. So often Ball changes genre from hagi hagiography via scholar discussion to contemporary social criticism, the unsuspected reader will be utterly deranged, as was I the first time when I read it. Within this book, one can find a surprising point of interest. It seems that Ball tries to develop something one could call a theology of sound. To summarize or synthesize this sound theology is a perilous endeavor in itself because of the eccentric nature of Ball's book. But one passage within Byzantinus's Christendom, however, is so particular for his theology, it can be used here to exemplify what Ball meant when he spoke about the religious implications of sounds. Because of his own dualistic tendencies, which were, as he perfectly knew, incompatible with his new-found Catholic faith, Ball tried, and quite inconvincibly, to differentiate between what he coined good and bad gnosis. The difference between the two are far from clear, however. But on one page, hidden in one of Ball's extensive footnotes, the author praises Gnosticism. And I quote, while being closer to the antique philosophy than ecclesiastical Christianity, it contains magic spells, Zauberformen, secret names and sound images, Lautgebilde, which both ensure the victory of the mind over flesh. Ball quotes in the same footnote the so-called fourth book of a Gnostic Apocrypha, written in Coptic and known as the Pistis Sophia from the second half of the 4th century. The risen Christ is standing in front of the altar among his apostles. Then Jesus prayed to his God and Father. Aya iu aya ayo psis noster pnernos mosister zugara pakura. Except for one word at the end of the prayer, Sabaot, the prayer consists of nothing but sounds, with no words in the conventional sense. It is neither Greek nor Coptic nor any other known language. Associations rise with the phenomenon known as glossolalia within the Christian tradition as with the so-called nomina barbara from the Kabbalistic tradition. Ball reflects even more on this by comparing this sound prayer from the pistis to an alchemistic procedure. And I quote, the names of angels and gods are intertwined in an alchemy of words and vocals, a magical form of analysis and asceticism." End quote. This reminds a careful reader of Byzantinus' Christendom of an earlier passage where, where Ball spoke 
about the Scala Paradisi, a work written by John Climacus as a handbook for desert monks. Ball characterizes the writing process of the Scala as the Auflösung of the old connections and as a potion which is to be distilled. Bilder zerschmelzen und Worten erglühen, Urteilen ändern Gestalt und Wesen, so lange bis sich aus solcher uns fremd gewordenen Alchemie das lautere Gold der Seele ergibt. Dann erstarrt unter zarten Hämmern die Sprache. In this concept of a divine sound, Ball's Dadaistic and Neo-Catholic inclination become intertwined, leading to an infinitive new theology of sound, which consists of three dimensions, an incarnational, a metaphysical, and an anthropological dimension. I shall discuss those three elements of Ball's theology in a nutshell, of course. This presentation could be implying that Ball's theology is consistent and systematical, which is absolutely not, thanks to his Dadaistic, associative ways of thinking and writing. These dimensions are a first effort to synthesize what, in essence, is not. The first dimension of Ball's theology of sound is the incarnational dimension. In Byzantinus' Christentum, Ball tends to identify prophets the saints of the Old Testament, like Solomon and Ezekiel, saints, John, Dionysus, Simeon, and artists, not made explicit, but essentially Ball means Kandinsky, Picasso, and himself. These saintly artists understand, repeat, interpret, and represent the Ursprache Gottes. The artist saints do not only repeat and interpret God's primordial creational sounds, but are the embodiment of those sounds. Their own existence has become the linen on which the divine painting is made. The second metaphysical dimension of Ball's theology of sound is concentrated on the aforementioned Ursprache Gottes. This central term in Ball's Byzantinische Christentum shall not be understood as a, dire as a direction to conventional language and human ratio, as is often implied in Logos-oriented theologies, but to the direct soundification of the divine. According to Ball, in God's Ursprache, sound and meaning coincide, in contrast with human language, in which there is a conceptual gap between signifier and meaning. The saintly artists, Climacus, Kandinsky, Ball, are part of God's Wortgewalt, or Sprachschatz. God's creational sound, crying, howling, did not evoke creation into being, but those divine sounds thickened themselves into everything that exists. The third and last dimension of Ball's sound theology is the anthropological dimension. In Byzantine Christendom, the term Ursprache Gottes is often connected to the term paradise, or more precisely to the term paradise-like human. Man has fallen from its original paradise-like state into the material world. Ball, as we have said before, was very susceptible to dualistic tendencies. Man had lost contact with God and is no longer able to understand the Gottes Ursprache. That is to say, he doesn't recognize it anymore as the actual fabric of existence. Man has to return to paradise lost by following the example of the saintly artists. For Baal, the paradise like man is God's holy primordial text to be read in the lives and teachings of the saintly artists. In Byzantine Christendom, Baal constructs a theology of sound in which the created world is a thickening of the primordial sound of God himself. This Ursprache Gottes is only accessible by the saints or artists of the old and modern world. This example of a mixture between Dada and Catholica sheds a new light on the historical avant-garde and its position on faith, religion and spirituality. Thank you very much.